do, but is that shared decision making? No, that just moves the decision making from the doctor to the patient, which we're trying to say is there's got to be this bridging of the gap in the middle where we work together. Hi, this is Unlimited Access. My name is Levi. Hi, I'm Shannon Ellsworth. And I'm Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Julie Shapiro. And uh, Dr. Julie Shapiro, Julie, you are from uh, South Shore. <laughs> it's gonna, I knew I was going <laughs> to. Sally Sells Seashells. You're from South Shore Hospital, correct? That's correct. All right. Well, we've had you on before, and it was really just interesting hearing kind of your backstory, how you got involved in medicine. And, uh, you know, we just wanted to kind of have you back in the show to really talk about more about what we call shared health decision making. And, uh, you know, me as the novice, I'm going to try to see if I can introduce it, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Shannon. But shared health decision making is this idea of, hey, I think I know what's wrong with me, but I kind of don't. And uh, you're giving me a lot of options. But we need to make a decision, and I kind of I'm leaning on you, and I'm leaning on maybe um, maybe a previous doctor visit. There's just a lot of things going on, and this idea that all this decision making's on me, it's way on my shoulder as the patient. But it's a lot more than that, right, uh, Shannon? Can you uh, further elaborate, maybe maybe from not a patient perspective, but maybe from an industry perspective? I think I'd, I'm going to leave Julie to answer that bigger question. For me, what I thought in our previous episode was, well, I know what I need. And yes, I'm I'm self-diagnosing almost. The doctor has, you know, gets to tell me what options I have. And I'm like, listen, I know how I feel. I know how I feel about my sinusitis. I can take care of it. I move on. And I thought it was a little bit more unbalanced than it is because I was like, I can take this all. I think I can but without the input of the doctor. So I, I think I would actually turn that over to, to Julie to say what truly is it. Cause she's the one, when I, when I said it, I was like, she's like, yeah, it's not quite that easy. Like I get to call up a doctor and I say, here's how I feel. I'm pretty sure I have sinusitis. I've had it for five years. Can you give me these drugs? <laughs> and they, and they, and they often do, but is that shared decision-making? No, that just moves the decision-making from the doctor to the patient which we're trying to say is there's got to be this bridging of the gap in the middle where we work together. So I guess I would not to throw the hot potato over to you, Julie, but you kind of educated me that that thought process was still a little one-sided. I actually think both of you have a good perception of what shared decision-making is. It is quite literally you share a decision in uh, the, the moving forward of your medical care. Um, it's my job to know what information I should share with you, what's going to be useful for you to um, to make some decisions about your care. It's my job to be able to give you some options. Um, we all know that medicine is an art, not a science, so there might be more than one option to every problem. As simple as taking antibiotics versus having an appendectomy, that, that's something that you could choose as a patient. So you and the physician need to decide with the information that's gleaned from the doctor and your information that you know about yourself and your about your past, what you want to do with that information. Um, it used to be that it was, well, you're the doctor, you get to say what I do next. Um, then the pendulum swung kind of in the other direction uh, where you would tell a patient what information you found and they may take that information or not, but then we would have them leave against our medical advice. And now we're meeting much more in the middle. It, there's just no clear um, one option for every diagnosis, and we need to work on it together to come up with what's going to be best for you. The... Um... Uh, two things real quickly, just a quick uh, um, side note, and I'll edit this out. Um, you are breaking up, Julie, but don't worry about it. Um, it's saving the video locally. So Shannon, I don't know if you hear Julie being um, breaking up. Yeah, I, I was I was hoping you would say I was going to jump in and say. Don't worry that. about it. No, um, it's it's recording it locally. And um, so we'll still get the, the high resolution file that way. Um, but back back to the show, you know, you know, you're an ER doctor. And again, we talked about it last time, this idea of like the high pace environment of what you're in. 
given all the time constraints in the high pressure environment of the ER, how do you, Julie, um, you know, incorporate shared health decision making in your day to day practice? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, some folks can be fairly succinct in their questions, their decision making. Others can take a lot of time. Um, you know, you just have to do what's best for the patient. Uh, sometimes it means a delayed trip to the bathroom. Sometimes it means an interruption in your conversation because somebody else sick or comes in. Um, but you just have to always think what's best for the patient. Um, so you just kind of make it work. I mean, I'm going to cut you off probably at 20 minutes. Um, I might ask you to phone a friend, um, but you just have to do what you have to do. I think, uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. So, in in your scenario, and what what's the ideal like scenario where you do have shared? Decision? I think about the time that I was like often in there with my mom mm -hmm. and trying to help represent her and her information but the doctor really needed to hear from her. So it was a constant of the caregiver being like, and I do this with my dad now. I think we joked around about one of the other episodes. His doctor calls me his probation officer. I don't know if I should feel good <laughs> about that, but and he'll, dad will be like, listen, <laughs> he'll ask my dad, like, when did you last fall? And my dad will be like, oh, it's been a few months. And I'm like, but was it? <laughs> and the doctor looks at me and I, and, and he and I have built a really good rapport because that's his primary care. So I'm in there pretty much every six months, every three months with him. So it's kind of a, is it two hours, is it four hours? So we, we have a pretty good also eye contact thing going on. That's like how, you know, cause his memory is, is short with my mom. She was very proud and wanted to communicate mm -hmm. it. And I could tell sometimes the facts were kind of incorrect and, but she wanted to be part of that decision-making process and then the caregiver. So you say like, can you phone a friend? What is what does that mean? What's a good example of maybe one where you've had somebody involved, and how does that work? How do we bring more value and or not interrupt the patient and make them feel unvaluable? Like that was my mother gets so mad at me, like you're talking over me, and I'm like, I'm not. I'm trying to help. So yeah, from your perspective, maybe an example or advice. So a great example of uh, something like that would be. Exactly the, the case that you just suggested. An older person who's starting to have some memory troubles, but still very functional. Um, and that person is steadfast in making their own medical decisions. But you as the very caring and very knowledgeable family member um, have information that is very valuable to the decision making. So uh, you again, we're professionals. We have to figure out a way to make the patient feel valued, a way to make the patient feel like this is all about them, um, and a way to make a patient feel like their voice is the most important voice in the room. Having said that, um, you, know, you do need to use the information that the caregiver has, um, and quite honestly, you need to use the information that everybody has to make the right decision. So it that, again, is a part where the art but let's give an example. Um, your mom, so we'll just call her uh, Beverly. Um, Beverly comes in and she's fallen and she's got a big bruise on her head. And we've worked up that she doesn't have any bleeding in the brain. She's not um, got any cervical spine injury. Um, and she has maybe a very mild urinary tract infection that probably was uh, in some way continue uh, what's the word looking for um contributing to her fall um she's like i am out of here i do not want to stay there's nothing about me that's dangerous i'm going home and you're the caregiver and you're sitting there mom you know you fall three times this week you can't walk around your house without uh hanging on to furniture um you fell yesterday and you forgot to call the doctor and you've got a bruise on your, on your bum. Um, I think it's unsafe for you to go home. So you and mom are doing this. Um, and I try to come up with some alternatives. Okay. Well, Beverly, do you have a visiting nurse? Do you have uh, someone who can be with you to help you transfer from the bed to the chair and from the chair to the toilet? Do you have, uh, any friends that you can, you know, call in to help you deliver groceries. So 
So it's, again, my job to come up with some alternatives. And that's when I might leave you to discuss the options. Um, you guys can have a, a spirit of discussion about it. And um, at the end, we, we usually try to come up with what's the right thing. Um, most of the time, folks will see that their safety is important. Sometimes you do have to send people home in a little bit of harm's way. Luckily, many emergency departments have um, care progression uh, f- folks who can help facilitate visiting nurses and, and home health care. But, but I, I digress into some of the details. It, it is all about everyone making a decision together. I, yeah, I hear, I hear two things. And then, I'll leave. I'll let you jump in. But I hear two things, which is one: how can we empower the the patient along with the caregiver? Like, if we had not to plug Ursman, but this was kind of one of the other things that I thought about was have an app where you can plug down. Did you fall? Like, listen, my dad falls a lot more than he wants to tell me. I'm his child. He doesn't want to admit it. Um, and so, hey, I'm like, you got a big scab on your head. You must have fallen but give them the empowerment to write these things down and communicate that in a way so that they're sharing that decision-making with you where the caregiver is just encouraging and part of that documentation, right? Hey, dad fell yesterday. I Like, listen, I walked out one time and he was on the ground outside and I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, oh my God. So document the date time that empowers him to have that conversation with you. Right. I know. I was like, he's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm like, no, you're not. But again, he's got neuropathy. So there's things that I didn't know. And then being able to have that, that um, I don't know if genteel is the word, but the fact that you come up with options and I'm thinking about like, the, like you who goes, do you have these people to visit you? Do you, you find other ways to ask that person? Do you have this without saying, Hey, caregiver, are you doing this? But Hey, do you have somebody to make sure you've got railings in the right places? Those are not those are not challenging questions. They're just thought process of there are ways to address this that are not huge deals. But having a railing on the one stair in my house, really amazingly with neuropathy, is a huge difference because him getting down those stairs, and that's how we ended up tripping. So I just kind of heard two things there, which is like there's lots of different ways that we can empower the patient along the way without you know, it having to be this, this battle of, you know, it's, and it's a three-way conversation. And plus, yeah, um, it's, so, um, I don't mind being oh, go ahead, the Julie. bearer of bad news. Um, and patients will take what I have to say without emotion. Whereas if you say, dad, I don't think you're safe to drive. There's a lot of, there's a lot of baggage. Oh. That. But if I say, yes. hey, you've been here the third time this month for a car accident and I don't think you're safe to drive, it comes differently from me than it would come, or from a physician or, or sure a healthcare professional. It comes differently than it does from a family member. So again, that's a shared decision. Sorry. No, that's like that's what it's like parenting out one. <laughs> no, that's like parenting one on one, right? One. Yeah. You have right. to, uh, um, you know, have somebody else give your kids advice, the same advice you would give, but, uh, you can't, you can't give any advice to your children. They'll never listen to you. Um, you know, yeah. we talked about another uh, of example, Julie, that really struck home with me only because last week I was on a golf trip down in Florida. I left upstate New York. I went down to Florida with a bunch of guys in their sixties and seventies. I was the young guy in the group. And, um, if, if we get injured on the golf course or something happens, uh, we go to the, the ER, we go to the doctor and all of our medical records are somewhere else in Texas or New York or, and you had a really good example. Um, can you elaborate on that again? That was, that was really, that was really apropos to my experiences last week. Sure. Um, so I'm sorry, where did you say you were golfing? I, I don't get me started, but I got to go to a <laughs> TPC Sawgrass. I went to Ponte Vida and played the uh, stadium course and I birdied the 17th hole, the Island Green. So I'll take the accolades wow. later. It was, it was great. It was great. <laughs> that sounds terrific. Um, yeah, an ER visit for any of you could really be a bummer um, for what a, a great trip that sounds like. Um, so let's make that trip as quick as possible, right? Um, the example right. that I had is uh, a perfect example is a 65-year-old man 
So a guy who's been around the block a few times, but still, you know, young enough to be out playing golf and probably maybe working a little too hard, stretching his uh, his physical capabilities, showing off in front of his friends. Yeah. And he's got this ache in his left shoulder. <laughs> no. And uh, as we all know, left shoulder discomfort can be a lot of things. It can be a heart attack. Um, you know, if your arm feels sore and it feels heavy, it could be a stroke. It could be just a localized inflammation of like your bursa or your muscles. It could be a cervical spine injury. It could be any of those things. And um, I need to figure out what information to gather. Some of that information is quick, like the EKG, um, that I think almost anyone who is listening to this podcast would know what that is, but that's a quick electrical um, story that your heart tells you for a few seconds, and you can see it on paper. Um, there's a CAT scan of the brain to see if you've got bleeding or, or a big, huge mass or some horrible thing in your brain. Um, those things are fairly quick. Some blood tests are fairly quick. But there are things that are really important to get in a patient if you're not sure if they've got um, a heart attack or a stroke or a cervical spine injury that take more time. Um, Like an MRI of the cervical spine, that could be an 8, 10, 12, 24-hour wait in some cases just to get an Mm -hmm. MRI machine available. Um, You can have certain imaging um, that takes a while, like uh, an MRI of the brain or certain vascular imaging to look at your to look at your head, a stress test or cardiac catheterization. These things take time and that could make your visit to the emergency room for this ache in your shoulder that you think is just muscular. That could make your visit turn into two days and ruin your whole trip. Um, so if you um, if you have information that you've gathered in the past, let's say three months ago, uh, you had a, a physical exam by your primary doctor, and your doctor did uh, cardiac enzymes, and that person did cholesterol, and you had a stress test as part of your, um, you know, five-year. I don't know. I don't know what the primary care doctors do, but I imagine that they do order stress tests and echocardiograms and those kind of things with some regularity, especially if you've got left shoulder discomfort. Or maybe even you've already had an MRI of your cervical spine and you know you've got a a slipped disc there. If you have that information, and I don't have it because I'm an emergency doctor in, you know, uh, St. Thomas, and I don't have access to your records, um, you and I could have a discussion. Well, I think you should stay and make sure your heart's okay and get another cardiac catheterization or another stress test or maybe an MRI and that's going to take two days. I think those things should happen. And You're like, look, I've had these things already in the past few months. I don't need this. Um, That's an example of, well, let's come together and make a decision together as to what you think is causing your discomfort. Even a step greater is if you were a patient who had Ursuline, and you had all of the information that you've just gathered easily accessible, you wouldn't have to prove to me that you've had a stress test or an MRI or all of this evaluation, and it would make that shared decision-making that much easier and quicker. Yeah, I can imagine. So from a I could imagine how much faster we talked about people going out a door for you, <laughs> how much faster if you had all that information and being able to say quick shared decision making, the patient feels good. I mean, how many of us dread the wait? Mm-hmm. And then you and I talked about the lack of patient privacy and the interruptions and just the fatigue. Like, I, that's all I'm just listening to you. And I'm thinking all of that. I'm like, God, how, how much value we could bring in that shared decision making in the ER, which you don't think you think you would think people going into the ER were like, Hey, tell me what's wrong. But there's so much information we can bring with us that could Mm -hmm. now with chronic illness and things like that could bring us out pretty quickly. And the faster that we all own that as patients, the faster we'll all move through the ER, right? We'll all get through it. And you'll be you know, that's a really interesting thought process. But also from a, there was another piece of it. And I don't know, like, do you have to worry about the follow-up? Like, let's say it is an arm strain and they have to go to PT. Is that, 
do they get kind of ricocheted back to their primary care for that? Or do you hope, because you and I talked about, can they do the follow-up? Can they, will they do the PT? If you send them out the door with a plan, will they do that follow-up? And do they have the ability to do that follow-up? How does that happen in that kind of scenario? So just like I would love to have the information that preceded the visit, I think that if you were a primary care doctor or a physical therapist, you would also appreciate the information that preceded the visit. So if I obtained, let's say, a CAT scan or a stress test or some blood work, um, and that then made the next course of action physical therapy, I think the physical therapist would really appreciate, or the step in between the primary care doctor would really appreciate that information so that they don't have to go back and get that information to make a decision about physical therapy. Um, I do want to bring up one yeah. other option for shared decision-making. It's not always about leaving the hospital. Sometimes it's about staying. Um, so sometimes, you know, you go to the hospital and you are in a lot of pain and you have no idea what's going on. Um, and you have got a CAT scan that doesn't show any information, doesn't explain your belly pain. Your gallbladder was removed um, two years ago, so it can't be that. Um, you're able to uh, do all of your functions, like eat and move your bowels, um, but you're in a lot of discomfort, and you are scared. Sometimes that shared decision-making is, well, the doctor says there's nothing wrong. They're going to kick me out. But hey, I'm really scared, and really nervous, and I don't feel comfortable leaving. And I do think that that's another example of shared decision making. I don't want anyone to think that shared decision making just means leaving against the doctor's advice. Sometimes it can be staying despite yeah. the information that one gathers during their emergency department visit. Yeah, I had a uh, a friend on said golf trip last week talk about that story where he um woke up in the middle of the night feeling you know chest pains and he thought he had some sort of indigestion but his wife said go to the hospital he went to the hospital and he got there and they were like well you're probably having you know indigestion we'll see you on monday but the wife was like no i think he's really you know, struggling with a heart attack. And so it was, a, it, it was a comical story from him getting from one hospital to the next, um, because the hospital he was at didn't have the ability to diagnose a heart attack, I guess. Mm -hmm. So he had to, it, it was a comical story, but he did get to the other hospital and he was having a heart attack and he did have a catheter and, there you, and you know, they probably saved his life. Oh. Right. But, um, you, you know, thinking back to the other golf story though, where you said, you know, the, the golfer out of town has some sort of pain in his left shoulder or this left shoulder. And, uh, you know, I, I think what's really neat to plug our app is the idea that not only is the information in there for the people in that room, but I can also communicate clearly with like my wife who's back here in New York. Hey, I've got sh pain in the mm -hmm. shoulder. Whatever Julie writes into the app or whatever note is automatically put in there. Um, I can also probably quickly get my, uh, you know, my local provider, you know, my, um, primary care doctor involved because he doesn't have to like try to communicate directly with you and some coordinate some sort of meeting. He could probably just see what you're writing into the app and, and your, his notes will be in there mm -hmm. too. So it's just really this network effect, this, this, we're going to call it an architecture, Shannon, an architecture of information. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon's been trying for me to incorporate that word a lot more in my vocabulary when it comes to <laughs> not in this conversation. We don't want to talk about medical concerns. We don't call it architecture. It's, it's architecture. When we talk medical informatics and where that medical information should be stored, then we can talk about architecture. <laughs> well, but but the idea that everybody has it's a network effect, right? And everybody's going to be looking at the same thing, the patient, the physician there at the ER, and also potentially you know, my spouse here back at home and my primary care doctor. So everybody's looking at that same information to make, I guess, a shared health decision. Well, and I think, I think, yeah, and to add to that, it's really about removing the noise to what's pertinent. How do we mm -hmm. work through that storybook of what you know and this is where jill and i've talked quite a bit and she shared with me it's the noise that you know that all the data coming at you and trying to find the right data especially in an er situation where it's you know 
at least with a primary care, you may have a history of that person. It's pretty natural. What you need to fill the gaps in the system, if you want to talk architecture, the system is in fact set up where all of this stuff gets sent back to the primary care. Usually, usually there's an automatic boom back to the primary care because they're the quarterback, but there's, you know, there might be five, six, eight other people involved with your care that don't naturally get updates. So yeah, so it's making sure everybody can see the same information, but also making sure that everybody sees the piece that they need to see to make their next decision, not necessarily all information is important. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's it's a really good conversation. This is this has been really great. And I super appreciate the fact that you were able to bring in this uh, golf trip that I had, because that's what I really want to talk about is <laughs> my golf trip. Right? <laughs> that's you really want to bring up his birdie on the 17th hole. Birdie on the 17th hole. <laughs> we'll I can go back and we'll I'm leave that for yeah. Well, you know, Julie. I don't it's know, been... Julie. What, do, do you golf, Julie? No. <laughs> do you, do you golf? No. Julie? No. Okay. Then we know. Another... <laughs> but I know what a birdie is. <laughs> we'll have to qualify the next speaker. And I do know there are 18 it's holes. It's good. Perfect. Course, so I've, I've got the, the minimum amount of information I need to make that story work. And he played a PGA course. And he played a PGA course. Oh. So put, put the 17th hole island, island green PGA level birdie. It was good. Man, high five to Levi. High five, high five. And, and that's what there. I look for, a lot of positive affirmation in my uh, life. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, Thank you. Well, Julie, you, you've been <laughs> a lovely again, um, and I super appreciate you uh, just participating and helping us uh, you yeah. know, get this information out because, you know, from a patient perspective, the kind of the approach that I look at it, it's all new. It's all new to me. And um we need more education and more information in this area. So I really appreciate it. Shannon. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. We'll continue our conversations where you open up, uh, kind of get my mind blown a lot. So looking forward to, to that. And thank you for joining us. We're, uh, pushing these out and sharing with people who the, the folks who motivate and, uh, encourage me to move down this path with Ursman. So thank you for that. And thank you for listening. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys.